Hello. In today's video, I'd like to talk about the early roots of landscape archaeology. This is a pretty big topic for such a short video, so I'll focus mainly on what British archaeologists called field archaeology, even though very similar things were also going on in the Middle East, continental Europe, and North America at the time. Many of the methods that these early pioneers developed may seem old-fashioned today, but for their day they were quite innovative and allowed, for the very first time, archaeologists to begin to understand rural life in ancient and medieval times. The methods that they developed came particularly into their own during the advent of aerial photography, and many of the images that these pioneers captured remain a really important resource today. The earliest examples of what some people call field archaeology long precede the advent of aerial photography. In the 17th and 18th centuries, European aristocrats, country squires, and clergymen took considerable interest in the monuments and other traces of antiquity that they could find in their landscapes. One such individual was Reverend William Stukeley. Stukeley was an English physician and Anglican clergyman who was fascinated by the signs of antiquity in the English countryside. He's best known for his drawings and observations on Stonehenge and Avebury, but he also saw these monuments in their landscape context. For example, in the area around Stonehenge, he recorded the Cursus and the Avenue and numerous barrows, and he also showed how Avebury was related to other monuments and features in its neighborhood. Nowadays, many people would view these features as elements of a sacred landscape. He even paid attention to the intervisibility of monuments, something that modern archaeologists accomplish using a GIS. And Stukeley did not limit his observations to monuments of the Neolithic, Bronze Age, or Iron Age. He was also interested in Roman settlements and Roman military camps. By the late 18th century, there were many landed aristocrats, country clergymen, and rural school teachers who were documenting the antiquities in their neighborhoods. They often wrote about them in magazines, and in the case of England, that magazine was often the Gentleman's Magazine. As just one example, in the February 1824 issue, one Edward Rudge reports on two cromlechs, one in Oxfordshire and another in Kent. He describes them, provides a view of one and a map of the other, and speculates on their purpose and origins. Notably, even for 1824, he provides a map that could easily pass for a field drawing today. Field work by amateur antiquarians like Rudge documented sites that were rapidly disappearing, and also helped to encourage the preservation of the monuments that we have with us today. During the 19th century, archaeology had a somewhat prominent role in the rise of the nation-states that we have with us today, especially in Europe. After the French Revolution and especially the Napoleonic Wars, many countries, including France and Denmark, established national museums. When, in 1802, thieves stole the famous horns of Galahus and melted them down for their gold, there was outrage among the Danish public. Soon after, Adam Uhlenschlager wrote his famous poem, The Golden Horns, in which he portrayed these artifacts as symbols of Denmark's lost glory. This ushered in an age of romantic literature, during which poets and other authors recalled ancient glories as part of their work. At the same time, aristocrats' estates were being landscaped with gardens that had fake ruins in them. Newly emerging European nations and struggling ethnicities used artifacts and archaeological sites in order to help define themselves. Often this took the form of recalling ancient pagans, such as the German chief Arminius, who defeated a Roman army. Alfred Lord Tennyson repopularized the Arthur legend, using a romanticized Arthur as a symbol of England, much as Arminius served as a symbol of the unification of Germany. Meanwhile, industrialization and population growth were also having impacts. The construction of roads and railways often encountered archaeological remains, and new and more accurate 19th century maps began to show their locations, such as the Roman road marked on this map. 
while national museums and increasing numbers of regional museums began to record the locations of finds that were beginning to swell their collections. One of the most influential amateur archaeologists of the 19th century was the English Army officer Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers. He had become interested in archaeology in the course of his travels during the Crimean War, and his involvement in the technological development of rifles led him to have an interest in the evolution of artifacts. In 1880, he inherited the baronetcy of Pitt Rivers, which included the estate of Cranbourne Chase, which straddled the counties of Dorset, Wiltshire, and Hampshire. Cranbourne Chase's beautiful landscapes were, and still are, rich with the traces of antiquity, including barrows, mounds, hill forts, ridges, ditches, and other traces. Pitt Rivers conducted 17 seasons of fieldwork at Cranbourne Chase from 1880 until the end of his life. And today's archaeologists tend to think of him as the pioneer of modern excavation methods, including the meticulous mapping of the excavations and the meticulous recording of the finds. But some aspects of Pitt Rivers' fieldwork really pertain to landscape archaeology. He carefully mapped the earthworks in Cranbourne Chase, showing the locations of his excavations that made cross-sections across the ditches and ramparts in order to determine their stratigraphy. His most extensive fieldwork involved a study of the Bokerley Dyke at the border between Dorset and Hampshire. This is a sinuous earthwork that extends almost six kilometers in length. His fieldwork helped to establish that it was probably constructed in the Bronze Age or Early Iron Age and that it was cut through by the Ackerley Dyke, which is a Roman road constructed in the first century between Old Sarum and Bradbury Rings. The original purpose of the dyke may have been as a territorial boundary. If so, it's interesting to note that it continues to serve this purpose today as the boundary between two counties. At a still greater scale, archaeologists in the 19th and early 20th centuries began to plot the locations of sites on maps and try to look for patterns. This kind of activity took place not only in the United Kingdom and Europe, but also in North America, where William Mill's Archaeological Atlas of Ohio is only one example. The resulting sets of coordinates would later serve as the basis for point pattern analysis using a variety of statistical methods but its more immediate impact was to provide a basis for the study of large-scale trends, such as the spread of the linear band ceramic culture across Europe and its association with loose soils. During the First World War, some people were quick to appreciate the potential of the new technology of aircraft for the detection of archaeological evidence. This began a new phase of landscape archaeology. One of those pioneers of aerial archaeology was the French Jesuit missionary Antoine Poitabar. During the First World War, Poitabar was chaplain to the French forces in Syria. After the war, he was involved in relief efforts for Armenian refugees in Lebanon, and in 1925, he was commissioned a lieutenant colonel in France's Reserve Air Force. During his aerial reconnaissance missions, he noticed that traces of archaeological structures were highly visible from the air. From then until 1942, he made some 250 missions, which led to extensive publications on the Roman frontier in Syria and its associated towns and villages. Another pioneer of aerial archaeology was OGS Crawford. Like Poitabar, he owed his interest in aerial archaeology to his experience in aerial reconnaissance during the First World War, in his case, as a member of the Royal Air Force along the Western Front. In 1920, he joined Britain's Ordnance Survey and used Royal Air Force photographs to document the extent of Stonehenge's Avenue and to document many other prehistoric sites across various counties in England. Many such photographs show crop marks, variations in the vegetation due to buried walls and ditches that reveal sites and features that would not be visible to a person walking on the ground. These photos also reveal traces of ancient agricultural fields. 
In 1927, Crawford established the journal Antiquity and long served as its editor. He devoted many of its pages to aerial archaeology and field archaeology. Among those who contributed papers to antiquity on this topic were the married couple of Sir Cyril Fox and Eileen Fox. Although both appear to have been equally involved in the field work that led to these papers, this being the 1920s, Sir Cyril obtained most of the credit for the research. Sir Cyril was especially well known for his research on dikes, extensive earthworks that extended for many kilometers across the English countryside. These dikes appear to have marked boundaries between territories or to have been defensive in character. With a combination of ditch and ridge, with the ditch being on the side towards the enemy. Fox concluded that many of the biggest dike systems were post-Roman in date. However, Eileen Fox also did fieldwork of her own, including at the Roman legionary site of Isca Augusta in Wales. She was co-founder of the Hillfort Study Group in 1965, and a few years later also of the Exeter Archaeological Field Unit. By the 20th century, field archaeology did not just focus on monuments. And especially after the availability of aerial photography, it focused a lot on the traces of ancient agricultural systems. The shapes, sizes, and orientation of ancient fields was related to agricultural practices, and especially to the way they were plowed. Fields tended to be of a size that could be plowed in one day. And when the plows were pulled by large teams of oxen, it was difficult to turn them around. Consequently, there was an advantage to having long, narrow fields that would minimize the number of times the plowman had to turn around. Since the mold board, in turning over the earth, always threw it to the right, this led to the distinctive ridge and furrow type of field system. Although the path of the plow over most of its length was reasonably straight, there was a distinctive S-curve at the ends of each ridge and furrow. This resulted from the turning of the ox team. In post-Roman England and parts of Europe, the use of long, narrow fields that ran parallel to the contours of hill slopes resulted in the formation of terrace-like fields called lynchets or royaume in French. Another type of landscape feature that can be quite important is called a hollowway. Hollowways appear to result from repeated traffic over many centuries by people, their animals, and wagons. One of the ways these may form is when the traffic stirs up a lot of dust, much of which settles on the sides of the path. Over time, the path gets lower, while the banks on either side get higher. While hollowways have been well known among archaeologists for many years in places like Europe, more recently, scholars like T.J. Wilkinson have discovered that they occur in other places, including northern Iraq. On Mesopotamian floodplains, hollowways exist as linear depressions that radiate out from tells and sometimes lead to agricultural fields or neighboring tells. These help us understand the relationships between the inhabitants of the tells and the agricultural fields in the hinterlands on which they depended. In Mesopotamia and some other parts of the world, a very important piece of evidence for agricultural activities in such hinterlands consists of the remains of ancient canals. Long after the canals have dried up or silted up, they're still detectable by the spoil banks thrown up on either side. These are visible in aerial or satellite imagery, and ancient tell sites tend to cluster along the roots of these canals. Canals were not only a feature of the landscapes in ancient Mesopotamia, they occurred in many arid and semi-arid parts of the world. Here, for example, you see a map of ancient canals in the Phoenix Basin of Arizona. Another source of evidence for ancient agriculture consists of fields of corn mounds found in northeastern North America. Modern plowing and other forms of development has often eradicated these, but they do sometimes survive. Since modern landscapes can show ancient features of various periods, 
Dating these features, or even figuring out their order, can be challenging, with overlapping features forming a sort of palimpsest. But these overlaps can themselves provide evidence for the sequence. For example, this Iron Age hill fort is truncated by a small gully, showing that the gully is later in date, while these elongated ridge and furrow patterns extend down into the gully, indicating that they are later still. Here, the plow furrows ignore the traces of ruined farm buildings, almost seeming to pass under them, indicating that the buildings are later in date. Had the buildings been older, we'd expect those furrows to stop or curve around the buildings to avoid them. This long and somewhat irregular field wall cross-cuts the plow furrows in such a way as to indicate that those plow furrows already were there when the wall was built. And these very rectilinear walls ignore all previous traces on the landscape, including a portion of that earlier irregular wall, indicating that it's a recent feature. Increase A. Lapham, in his 1855 book on the antiquities of Wisconsin, also employed a version of horizontal stratigraphy to discern the chronological relationship between effigy mounds and fields of corn hills in Wisconsin's landscapes. Referring to one such site along the Milwaukee River, he says, However ancient these garden beds may be, they were not made until long after the erection of the earthworks, for they extend across them in the same manner as they do the adjoining grounds. Another sort of horizontal stratigraphy depends on the way that field walls abut on one another. In parts of the world where farmers clear stones from their fields by piling them into walls at the field boundaries. For example, at upper left, we can be pretty confident that wall A already existed when balls B and C were constructed. By contrast, in the top middle example, the relationship between walls D and E is ambiguous. And at upper right, it's unclear whether G and H preceded the construction of wall F or whether a portion of wall F was demolished prior to the construction of walls G and H. Despite occasional ambiguities like the one marked here, it's often possible to deconstruct walled fields in order to determine the original field that was subdivided, here shown at lower right. To summarize, most early field archaeology focused on monuments, but even some of that paid attention to traces of ancient fields. Aerial photography provided new tools for the discovery of ancient sites, as well as for our understanding of ancient agricultural fields. Traces of ancient roads, canals, and hollowways contribute to our understanding of the relationships among settlements and between settlements and their hinterlands. Careful scrutiny of the relationships among landscape features helps us to infer their chronological order. I hope you found something of interest in that video. In case you'd like to learn more about this aspect of landscape archaeology and its earliest practitioners, I've listed quite a few references in the bibliography at the end of this video. And if you'd like to be updated when I publish new videos, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.